Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy for this um, invitation uh, that came as a surprise and uh, following the Icelandic intervention, I should say, um, I, I, uh, my, my idea to, to accept, but I was fiddling with my agenda, uh, of course, uh, materialized. Now, um, why uh, was I trying to, to find the time to come to you and to address you today is um, because of your choice of the uh, theme for this conference. I do believe that uh, discussing the role of international law and human rights is, well, it has always been very important. Um, recent, uh, various recent, not only European, but you mentioned also various uh, uh, sort of crisis situations outside Europe simply confirms that uh, this uh, discussion on the role of international law and human rights uh, remains extremely important. So I consider the theme was very well chosen and this is why I participate um, in this conference with uh, great pleasure. Now, um, there will be two points I will make today uh, for um, your discussions. Uh, the first point will concern uh, what I would call a uh, European vision of, of human rights or what is happening with the European vision of human rights. And just mind you, I simply don't have time to develop, but when I say European vision, by no means I, uh, I uh, engage myself in the discussion that uh, there should be a, a, a European vision which is imposed on other parts of the world for uh, sake of time, and I will explain uh, uh, what do I mean by that, uh, it is simply that since we are in Europe, and Europe has lots of experience and mechanism, uh, mechanisms on human rights protection, uh, there is a reason to discuss the issue, what comes out of Europe, what is offered by Europe, so it is in this sense. And my second point, uh, that is more sort of for your information, for awareness raising, I will indeed uh, introduce very briefly what is the European Court of Human Rights doing in terms, uh, in the cases relating to the rights of the child and uh, the protection of women. And I hope you will find it um, interesting um, as well. Now, as to the first sort of if you want uh, a policy issue, legal policy issue, um, evidently this is more inspired by my uh, previous uh, uh, life where I was uh, uh, academic and, uh, and looking at the processes in Europe and actually being in a way in the middle of these processes through the work in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I'm making uh, this more, a more academic, if you want, uh, observation. Now, you will all recall that when the European Court of Human Rights was established after World War II, and when the European Convention on Human Rights was signed in 1950, uh, at that very moment, there was a very specific purpose for which this mechanism was created. And at that very moment, uh, led by Winston Churchill, there was a very clear vision uh, of the need for the protection of human rights as they were enunciated in the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, I'm going to submit to you, and that was already echoed by the, uh, the introductory addresses to you, that uh, today we live indeed in a different world uh, altogether. Uh, Europe has uh, changed. And I would uh, dare to submit that the challenges uh, that modern society has are probably more numerous and, and, and certainly more, more, uh, more challenging. Now, as far as the work of the European Court of Human Rights is concerned, um, uh, the difficulty is <laughs> the following. Um, the first uh, stems from the fact that uh, European Court of Human Rights today, 21st century, 
is faced with the cases that stem, I should say, from situations which normally arose in the 19th century, before the United Nations Charter outlawed the use of force between the states. Now, we do have cases this, that stem from the evident use of force between the neighbors, and the court has to deal with those cases. So it, that's a 19th century situation. The bulk of the court's work, of course, has to do with, I should say, uh, situations typical to the 20th century. That's what the court was, when the court was uh, founded, and, and the purpose was to indeed deal with uh, those rather typical situations of uh, excessive use of force by the authorities, uh, in human conditions, in detention places, rule of law issues, lack of independence of the judiciary. I call those, unfortunately they are daily situations, but I call those the 20th century problems, and I'll come back to that. Now, the court has entered into the types of cases that characterize indeed the 21st century. Those have to do with the development of IT technologies. Uh, those have to do with incredibly fast developments in uh, medical science, in research. So the court has also those, not for the moment not so many, but we are already there. So um, the fact is, and there was a purpose why I was telling you this, the European Court of Human Rights is, of course, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the key players on the European stage as it comes to the protection of human rights. I don't think I'm dis disclosing anything new, uh, uh, anything uh, unknown. But the fact of the matter also remains, and there comes uh, the backlog stories that you have heard, or the amount of work that the court has. Um, the fact of the matter remains. Uh, while the states have not done their homework, the court has the whole spectrum of three century cases in front of it. Now, that is, of course, for one institution like that, even as I was told the other day, a world level court indeed it is, but it is uh, quite an impossible task to attend to. And here I come back to the vision, to the European vision of human rights. Uh, in, in, a, in a, indeed, uh, in a least prejudicial way, using uh, the term uh, European. I think somewhere uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, uh, having been, in fact, in my own country, part of, of, of the, the, uh, the, the processes that, that Latvia went through, um, at that moment, which was the moment of, of great relief, of uh, uh, extreme emotion, uh, certainly in Europe, in the East and in the West, somehow everything seemed to be very pink, good colours, roses flying. And since then I, I have missed, what I am missing is uh, uh, those responsible for, for European policy decisions coming together and actually agreeing for the 21st century this is like Churchill did for 20th century, for 21st century, this is our act together. Uh, and I, I see sort of you, the, the work of the, of the Institute and also these conferences very much contributing to this search of what the common, uh, common human rights vision and agenda uh, should be um, in, in Europe. Now, I think that would require sorting uh, the outstanding uh, domestic problems, such as uh, lack of domestic remedies for human rights uh, violations, uh, such as uh, uh, problems uh, in uh, implementing uh, laws and decisions in accordance with the rule of law uh, and transparency principles. Now those, of course, must be solved, uh, and I think European states in particular, given their experience, can do so and can uh, be a guiding, at least, uh, uh, player in, in showing what, where uh, the world as such might want uh, to, to go. Now this is 
One point that I wanted to, to share with you for your further reflections, uh, it, I know it opens a lot of sort of possibilities for further reflection, but if you know how the court feels now, <laughs> then you might be maybe better uh, in a way advised where you should uh, focus um, your uh, reflections. Now, as far as oops, um, as far as the protection of children and women um, is concerned. Um, as you know, the European Convention on Human Rights does not contain specific provisions as concerns children and women. It is not, it doesn't have uh, uh, sort of the, the types, type of uh, provisions like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child or the UN Convention on Elimination of uh, Discrimination Against Women. It doesn't have these specific provisions. However, however, the court has extensively dealt with, uh, with cases where the rights of the children and women have been at stake. Now, uh, the court has recognized as the key principle in its judgments, the principle of the best interest of the child. So this is indeed our guiding light when we deal with any number of cases where children are concerned. Those cases uh, may have to do with the custody disputes. Uh, those cases may have to do with the, uh, with the uh, uh, implementation of the uh, Hague Convention on the return of the children to their um, habitual place, uh, places of residence. They may have to do with juvenile offenders. They may have to do with uh, expulsions of, of uh, immigrants who happen to be uh, 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 minors. So in all of these cases, under different articles in the Convention, uh, the best interests of the child have, uh, principle has emerged as uh, the guiding principle. Of course, we have also said, because we have Article 8 on the right to privacy and family life, we have said that uh, a child should benefit from the family, but there are situations where parents simply uh, can't look at each other and uh, uh, where uh, there is very little that either domestic authorities or even ourselves we can do. In that case, the best interests of the child would be the objective standard against which um, the decisions of domestic authorities uh, will be um, assessed. So in all of the decisions, we ask the domestic authorities to evaluate what are the best interests of the child in the specific circumstances um, of, of, the, of the dispute. Now, the uh, recent authority on this principle is the Grand Chamber case uh, X uh, against Latvia. Um, in which uh, the court effectively found that the domestic courts did not properly assess the arguments submitted to the courts uh, by, uh, by, by the, the uh, plaintiff as concerned the best interests of the child uh, in that particular case. In Saldos against Turkey case, uh, which concerned uh, the presence of a lawyer at the police interrogation, we found that uh, uh, the presence of a lawyer is obligatory from the first uh, moment of interrogation, and that case did concern a juvenile offender. So we said even more so uh, if there is a minor present. In the case Maslow against Austria, we dealt with the issue of expulsion uh, from Austria to the country of origin. In that case, it was uh, Bulgaria. It was a young person who had happened to offend many times. So that was a juvenile offender. Um, and, and, but in that case, he had not benefited from uh, the required means of rehabilitation. I mean, if you look at the United Nations standards on juvenile offenders, then you will see that one of the key requirements is working with the with the with the these minors and and Austria had not provided for that so it was in this context that uh, if you the only thing you could think of is, is to expel to another country instead of trying to to rehabilitate the court uh, indeed felt that that was disproportionate and uh, and found um, a violation 
Um, there are two recent, I'm sure, uh, cases that will be uh, uh, continue being discussed, analyzed, Soderman against Sweden and O'Keefe uh, uh, against Ireland. O'Keefe against Ireland concerns the abuse by the church of the minors in the 70s. And uh, Soderman concerns the uh, secret filming in the bathroom by a stepfather of his stepdaughter, uh, a teenager and the absence of uh, legislative provisions that would have allowed Swedish law enforcement to bring charges for uh, such, uh, such offence. Um, now, in all of these cases, these are just few, but I think it gives you the the, the, the already the impression how many of the cases we, we unfortunately, you could also say have, where minors uh, are really uh, in the center of the case. And the court has clearly recognized that uh, um, children are particularly vulnerable. Uh, you will see that uh, in the Soderman case, um, aligning ourselves also with uh, years of work uh, on the rights of the child in the, uh, at the United Nations level. Now, as, as far as women are concerned, um, I wanted simply to say to you that um, in front of the court, of course, we have applicants, both men and women. And the problems that men and women bring forward, uh, they, uh, they do not uh, differ in any particular way. Uh, there can be uh, uh, the same problems in terms of access to court. There can be the same problems in terms of the lengthy justice. There can be the same problems in terms of treat treatment at the police station. Um, there are no, no uh, uh, evident uh, differences where there are problems, there are problems, unfortunately. However, we do have um, a rather by now, a, a rather by now, I should say, um, long line of judgments concerning domestic violence. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, these cases uh, have concerned women. We do not exclude that they may concern men as well. But, uh, but so far, the cases show that uh, uh, these, the, the, the violence has been directed towards um, uh, women. Now, um, one of the, I would say, uh, leading cases that I wanted to, uh, to refer you to um, it was re rendered by, by the chamber I, I was uh, at the time, uh, Opus against Turkey, and it concerned indeed the rather grave situation of domestic violence as a result of which the mother of the applicant, uh, uh, the applicant was uh, shot dead by the husband. And it actually showed, it showed difficulties to dealing with domestic violence. Um, and primarily the fact that the law enforcement, the police and prosecution and, 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 and the courts are not quite prepared or trained to react uh, where necessary in preventive manner to the signs of domestic violence. And you often would have certainly in European jurisdictions that the, the police investigates if there is a complaint, and if you withdraw the complaint, which is what often women unfortunately do, then there are no clear guidelines uh, for the police force or the prosecution whether to maintain uh, the investigation or the, to survey the, um, uh, the situation. Now, this is a case where the court very clearly uh, established its, its position. Domestic violence is a lot about uh, special training of the law enforcement and uh, uh, the, the, the obligation to protect. It is about the obligation to protect even in the absence of a formal complaint on the part of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, potentially the, the victim. So that is the, the, the first extremely important aspect of the case. But the second, uh, I should say even more important aspect, that is the first case and the only so far, where the court has found that domestic violence as such is a form of discrimination. 
is a form of discrimination and those of you who do follow uh, maybe this issue in particular and also who follow the, the, uh, the expert discussions and the discourse uh, within the context of the United Nations, you may have noticed that in fact uh, this was uh, where the, the, the UN discourse in fact arrived as well and noting that domestic violence should be uh, uh, considered as a form of discrimination. Of course, um, mind you that for UN bodies, which are not courts, <laughs> it's easier to arrive at some statements of principle. Now, for the court, and European Court of Human Rights works like any other court you might know at the domestic level, for the court to arrive uh, at uh, statement and finding of discrimination, there are the questions of, of standard of proof, of burden of proof, which in discrimination cases, of course, uh, are, are very complicated. Uh, but uh, we did have enough uh, uh, proof, uh, and the court uh, could also conclude on violation of, in this case, Article 14, which is a, a non-discrimination article in the European Convention on Human Rights as such. Now, uh, these are the, uh, the sort of, in, in this case, so you would imagine there was a violation of the right to life, Article 2, because we had, uh, we had a lethal outcome in Article 3 as concerns the, the daughter of the deceased uh, in terms of her own uh, um, fears, humiliation, and that's the prohibition of torture which is regulated by Article 3, where we also found a, a violation. Now, this was very quickly what the court represents, what are the thinkings, the feelings of the court, and how we do our work uh, on daily basis that is relevant for, uh, for the purposes of uh, your reflections and uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I have five minutes and then I have a next meeting. I have to run back to the court. Thank you very much.